The rise and fall of billionaire trader Stephen A. Cohen's hedge fund, SAC Capital, is operatic. But what exactly happened when the Justice Department put him in its crosshairs during the largest insider trading investigation in history? With her new book, Black Edge, Inside Information, Dirty Money, and the Quest to Bring Down the Most Wanted Man on Wall Street, journalist Sheila Kolhatar takes us inside the investigation as well as into the Wall Street gray zone where fortunes are made. Sheila, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Nice to be here. So Black Edge is a sort of insider Wall Street term for inside information. I'm curious whether people in Wall Street would like observers to think that inside information exists in a sort of gray area, or they clearly know when they're crossing the line. To some extent, that depends on who you ask, but I'll, I'll illustrate a little bit with an anecdote that is in my book. So um, there was a group of traders at SAC Capital who had these terms. They had white edge, gray edge, and black edge. And there was a senior portfolio manager who tried to teach the young guys coming in to work there what the difference was so they could stay out of trouble. So white edge was clearly publicly available information, information anyone could get from an SEC filing. Frankly, we all know that that's not that helpful if you're trying to make money trading because everyone has that information. It's already priced into the stock. So then there was gray edge, which is ambiguous. You know, it might be a comment from an investor relations person who you're very friendly with. Now, is that material non-public information or is that just whatever? They're right. telling that to everyone. It's, everyone knows it. So a lot of what analysts end up trafficking in is gray. Yes. Black edge was very clearly material non-public information that was over the line. And there's there's one very big example in this book, in the case of this Alzheimer's drug, a um, an SAC portfolio manager was alleged by the government to have gotten a look at secret drug trial results before they were public. That was very clearly black edge. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And you know, your book reads like a thriller. It's, it's, it's so much like a novel. But clearly, as soon as you read it, you can see how deep your reporting goes. When did you start working on this book and what sparked your interest? So I'm a former hedge fund analyst and I was working at Bloomberg Business Week. And at the end of 2012, the FBI went out to Boca Raton, Florida, and they arrested a gentleman named Matthew Martoma, who was a former SAC Capital portfolio manager. Very dramatic. You know, they stormed up to his door in Florida and he had left. SAC and was sort of semi-retired, they arrested him. And it became very clear after that point that the government was trying to perhaps use him to get close to Steve Cohen. And that's when I became really interested because, you know, you thought, what do they have? Well, I thought, what do they have? But yeah. also Steve Cohen is, was a legendary figure uh, on Wall Street. He was one of the most successful hedge fund managers of all time. He was someone people looked up to. I mean, there were people who wondered, you know, what he was doing to to generate these incredible returns. But he was an icon of the industry. And I thought, wow. If the prosecutors can get to him, that's a game changer. Now, you paint a fascinating portrait of Steve Cohen. I mean, you seem to have spoken to people in all areas of his life. Who did you speak with to put this portrait together? Well, I'll start by saying that a lot of these conversations I had to have were kind of background conversations, so the sources had to be confidential. And part of the reason is that when I started reporting this, which was really in 2013, there was so much legal drama and so many people were concerned about going to jail or their boss is going to jail or, you know, people were under non-disclosure agreements. Um, I was really fortunate that there was a vast trove of court documents that I could rely on as sort of the backbone of the book. There were trial transcripts and deposition transcripts. There were FBI notes, these 302s. I mean, the FBI had been out there kind of trying to flip people and putting on wiretaps. And often you can get the notes from those meetings. Those are really fascinating. But yeah, I had to piece it together through Amazing. a lot of conversations. And you say the FBI is trying to flip people. Bartoma never gave them anything on Cohen, correct? That's right. Neither did Michael Steinberg, who was another SAC Capital employee who was charged. And then his he was convicted, and, and then his convicted. conviction was overturned. So Bartoma's was not, but yeah. The fact that these two two employees did not give prosecutors anything on Cohen. Is that why they never eventually went after him directly? I think that is a big factor. I mean, ultimately, sort of towards the end of 2013, there was this big crescendo of evidence. They had charged these two gentlemen. They had various other cooperators who had said, you know, they'd been involved in things at SAC. And the government had to make a big decision. Are they going to go after one of the biggest fish on Wall Street? Are they going to enter into this huge, high-profile trial? You know, it would have been like the O.J. Simpson trial. Everybody would have been watching, the news media there. It was a high-stakes decision. And they had to take a really hard look at the evidence they had. And the fact is, they just did not have 
the smoking gun, yeah. the piece of evidence that definitively showed to a jury Steve Cohen right. got this information. He knew what it was. He traded on it. They didn't have it. So they ended up indicting SAC Capital instead. And that was still a pretty big deal. It was an historic sure. case. Cohen ended up paying enormous fines, almost $2 billion. But he himself has just continued to trade. He now runs a family office. And has emerged largely unscathed. He'll be able to go back to trading next year. You, you write in your yes. book, is that right? Yes, yep, remarkably. Do you think at this point then, you know, prosecutors regret perhaps not going after him directly since he has emerged relatively unscathed? I found that sort of the official line is that they did their job, and I think it's true that lawyers are trained to look at the evidence and do whatever the evidence tells them to do. So I think in that regard, they did the best they could. Right. There are critics. There are people who feel frustrated and feel like it's a reflection of a larger problem in our society. You know, there were no senior executives charged with crimes emanating from the financial crisis. You know, we often have this sense that companies can buy their way out of trouble rather than actually sending people to jail, and that perhaps leads to an increase in bad behavior. Right. So those are all questions we have to grapple with, especially now that we're, you know, there's a debate about really pulling back Wall Street regulation. You know, it's important to remember what was going on during those years earlier on when we had a very deregulatory environment, and it's important to have smart Absolutely. regulation. Sheila, so. thank you so much for coming to see us, and congratulations on writing such a fascinating book. Thanks.